as a whole, I'd say I've been pretty positive on this channel. I mean, sure, I've ripped apart the original Zelda and talked about things that I just do not understand in Pokemon, but as a whole, true anger is not something that I'd say that I've succumbed to. That all changes today. In a video that I think pretty much every countdown artist has to do at some point, I'm going to be talking about characters and games that I just hate. Whether it be down to their actions, dialogue, personality, gameplay, whatever, just as long as I don't feel any better about myself after shouting profanities at them when they're on screen, they're eligible for this list. So, well, let's begin. Red Steel 2 is an interesting game. Never played the first one, and honestly, looking at those review scores, I don't regret it, so I pretty much had no idea what to expect when it came to actually playing the game. When it did, though, I found out three major points of interest. The sword combat works surprisingly well, the self sheeted art style works very well with the East meets West aesthetic, and it has one of the most hateable characters I've ever seen. So, when you start up a new save file, you're immediately greeted by the desert, followed by the realization that you're being dragged through it by a motorcycle. Well, I can't say I've ever seen a game open quite like that before. Eventually you break free, get some weapons, and go to the main base of the main antagonist of the game. Now, this guy here is Pain. He's an asshole. He's the guy that was dragging you through the desert earlier. Honestly, he would probably be on the list if it wasn't for the fact that this happens to him. <coughs> Regardless, right before this happens, Pain tells you that his gang is being led by the main villain of the game and the number 5 entry on my list, Shinjiro. At first, you may think that this guy is just your generic samurai villain, but trust me, Shinjiro is so much worse. In the past, he was actually an apprentice of the Kutsugari, a clan of samurai cowboy guys that you're the last of. Now you may be wondering, why are you the last of the clan? Well, I'll tell you. It's because this asshole killed all of them! Why? Because they have powers full swords and he wants to be the only one with them so he can take over the world or some shit like that. Yeah, it's not really clear what his motivation is, but damn he wants it done. The thing I think I hate the most about him, though, is how stupid, lucky, and cowardly he is throughout the game. The first time you meet up with him, you disarm him and get him to the edge of a cliff, when, out of nowhere, a ninja randomly comes in and saves him. Hey coward, get back here and fight! The second time you confront him, you've just gone through a train and killed probably hundreds of his men. Instead of fighting you, though, he unhooks the train car you're on, throws a grenade at it, and leaves you for dead in the middle of the desert. The last time you confront him, though, once you prove your complete dominance over him, he gives his generic villain death speech of saying, there'll be others, and I'll never truly die, and all that generic shit. And then you kill him. 10 out of 10. I think it's been established that I like Pokemon. Maybe not as much as some other people, competitive battling still isn't a thing that I've gotten into, but it still stands as a favorite series of mine. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you are expecting me to start talking about Getsis or Asshat, but no, I'm not. I don't exactly like Getsis, but N is one of my favorite characters in Pokemon as a whole, and I don't think that it would have been as interesting if it wasn't for Getsis. And honestly, Asshat is just kind of annoying. Plus, in Gen 2, he mellows out, so I can't say that I hate him overall. No, for my most hated Pokemon character, we've got to look at the 6th generation. Sorry to people that like it, but honestly, X and Y were huge disappointments for me. The Pokemon roster was just kind of okay. I don't remember a single gym leader, Mega Evolutions have completely destroyed the game balance, and as a whole, nowhere is my disappointment more apparent than in the villainous team, Team Flare, and their leader, the number 4 pick on this list, Lissandre. Where's it Lysander? Lysander? Lysandre? I don't fucking know. I've actually seen quite a few people say that they like this guy, and my reaction is pretty much always something akin to... Wait... Seriously? I thought he was terribly put together. His motivation pretty much boils down to the generic, all people are evil, time for them to die trope. I mean, it would be alright had the game actually gone into his backstory, but no. He's just a cynical asshole. So much so that the central plot of the game revolves around him and his team trying to gain access to the ultimate weapon of the Kalos region and kill everyone. Except for the fact that he doesn't actually want total annihilation. He wants to keep him and his team alive. 
The strangest thing is that he actually does acknowledge that all of this is wrong. So, he wants everyone to die because they're evil, but then he does an evil thing by killing everyone and acknowledges that what he's doing is evil, but thinks that he himself isn't evil and his team isn't evil and they should survive even though they're doing that unabashedly evil. Like, it doesn't make any sense! Okay, so his motivations make no sense. Who cares? Pokemon isn't a series that generally has the most well-thought-out villains, so whatever. However, the thing that really puts him on this list is one little bit of dialogue between him and your rival. They ask him what he thinks about Pokemon when it comes to Annihilation. He responds by saying, even though he loves Pokemon, they fall under the control of humans, so they have to die too. That makes no sense! If all of the people are dead, then how are they going to be able to manipulate the Pokemon? It makes no sense. In a twist of fate that I'd call ironic if this wasn't Pokemon and thereby completely predictable, Lissandre activates the weapon and shoots it up into the air, where it comes right back down and destroys Team Flare HQ, presumably killing Lissandre. It hasn't been confirmed, but if so, Lissandre is one of very few characters in the Pokemon games that has actually died. You know what? Good. It means we won't ever have to deal with him again. Cave Story. Often looked at as the father of all indie games, it was one of the first instances that proved that a one-man dev team could actually work. And call me stupid because, after all, the game is called Cave Story, but I never expected this game to have much of a plotline. You are stupid! You are stupid! You are stupid! And don't forget, you are stupid! But seriously, the story in this game is actually really, really deep. I'll summarize. Basically, you're this dude called Quote, and you're on a floating island inhabited by the Amigas. These weird bunny cat people. Out of them, of particular note, are Sue, a newcomer to the Amiga village, Taroko, the younger sister of the village's late warrior Arthur, and honestly the only likable character earlier in the game, and King, the leader of the village that's kind of an ass but really just wants to protect his people. Now, Mega Village has a dilemma on their hands. Their people keep getting kidnapped. Specifically, the village is being asked to give up Sue in exchange for there being no more abductions after that. By whom, you ask? The number three pick on the list, the Doctor. Before the events of the game, the Doctor was a scientist that went on an expedition to do... something on the island. He abandons the other scientist with him when he comes across the Demon Crown. Out of those betrayed is Sue and her brother, Kazuma. But Kazuma is a human, so that doesn't really quite work. Turns out Sue was human, but was turned into a Amiga by who the fuck do you think? Worst of all though, his main plan is to take all of the Amigas and feed them red flowers, which for some reason turns them into these hideous monsters that he can control so that he can use them as minions and take over the world. Now that's bad enough, the thing that pushes it over the edge is a scene from about midway in the game. Earlier on, Balrog, this weird combination of the Kool-Aid Man and a toaster, abducts Taroko, thinking that she was Sue. When you eventually get to where they're keeping her, you find that she's being fed red flowers, so she's one of these... things. If that's not bad enough, out of nowhere, King comes out and tries to kill the Doctor, where he's struck by lightning by Misery, the Doctor's horribly named affiliate. At this point, our gang of villains leave, and you're forced to kill the one likable character from this point in the game, while the less likable but sympathetic character slowly dies on the sidelines. It was at this point that I could not put the game down. I was so filled with rage that I played through the entire rest of the game in one sitting, just so that I could get the satisfaction of killing the doctor. And it's not even satisfying then, because like five minutes later, you find him again in a different body. Oh wait, no, you don't, because he's a coward and turns both Misery and Sue into these weird hybrids of themselves and... something else. When you do eventually kill the Doctor by killing the undead core, it is so satisfying you would not even believe, though. Until you realize that you now have to go into the Bloodstained Sanctuary and you're more frustratingly afraid than anything else.
Fallout 3 is the kind of game that just inherently has a lot of hateable characters. I mean, there's Mr. Burke, Alistair Tenpenny, Yule G. Jones, the list goes on. Worse, though, I find to be the Enclave, specifically its two lead guys, President John Henry Eden and Colonel Augustus Autumn. Initially, Eden was going to be on the list, but then I found out that he's a computer. Come on, man! Excuse me for a minute. What do you want? Spoilers! Oh, come on! The game's been out for seven goddamn years! Anyone who's going to play it has either already played it, or acknowledges that it's been long enough to where you can talk about the game in uh, full- la, 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 I can't hear you, la, 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 Well, then I guess you won't know what I'll do this! <laughs> Man, those clones, they are just no good, are they? Anyway, as I was saying, when I found out that President John Henry Eden was a sentient computer, I lost interest in putting him on the list due to the fact that, well, he's a computer. It's not his fault that he is the way he is. Plus, the fact that you can convince him to blow himself up is something that I just find entertaining. Even if he did want to kill everyone. No, for the actual number two pick, we're going to have to go with the big number two of the Enclave, Colonel Augustus Autumn. About the first half of Fallout 3 was taken up by you trying to go around the Capital Wasteland in search of your father. When you eventually find him, you find that his goal is to reignite Project Purity, a water purification plan that he, your mother, and some other characters worked on before your character was born. Not literally reignite, because even if that worked, it would pretty much be completely counterproductive. Anyway, once you get everything up and running at the facility again, the worst possible thing happens. The Enclave shows up, helicopters and all, ready to take the project. Their main goal when it comes to taking the project, though, is just a little bit more sinister. They want to poison the water so that anyone who is of unpure blood will survive. And their interpretation of unpure blood is maybe just a little bit unfair, counting pretty much anyone that isn't them. Now, that's pretty evil, but this guy takes it up another level. When you eventually get to the main area of the facility, you'll see that he, your father, and a bunch of people that no one cares about are in the control room. And in his attempts to get your dad to just give the facility to him, out of frustration, he kills... that... person. Who is that? Probably her name's Janice? I don't know, I don't remember her. Anyway, he kills her for pretty much no reason, prompting your dad to flood the room with toxic radiation, killing him and presumably Autumn. That is, until a little bit later when he finds out that it didn't kill him. Now, it may sound like I'm getting mad at someone for not dying, but one, the guy shows absolutely no remorse for what's happened, and two, his forces end up getting the facility in the end. Finally, towards the end of the game, when you're captured by the Enclave and brought to Ravenrock, their HQ, where, against Eden's wishes, Autumn calls for the soldiers to kill you. God, I can't believe that Bethesda even put in an option to let you not kill him in the end, because by this point, I think most players have built up such a hatred for him to where no one wouldn't want to see him dead. Especially me. Because being able to shoot this guy in the face is the best part of the game. And then you get to kill yourself. It's kind of a win-win, you know? Number one, by comparison to the rest of the list, may not seem like the kind of character that would make it onto this list, let alone at number one. I mean, think about it. Shinjiro, kills your clan and plots to take over the world. The Doctor, kills likable characters early in the game and makes the life a living hell for the Mamiga. Stranger, kidnaps a little girl and tells you that you're a bad parent. There's at least a little bit of a disconnect there. Trust me though, this guy does definitely deserve to be on the spot he's at. Telltale's The Walking Dead is a game that I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. From the first time I played the game pushing two years ago, it shot up the list of my favorite games faster than the vast majority of the other ones I've played. I've never been a huge fan of point-and-click adventure games, but this one managed to hook me using the familiar Walking Dead setting that I knew from the television and comic book series, but through the really believable characters and intense and nerve-wracking situations, in my mind, it surpasses them. It frustrates me that so many people played the first episode and no others thinking that it was just okay, considering that episode 1 is by far the worst paced and most boring. It's not bad, just maybe a little harder to get into. 
If you're in that camp, stop watching this video, buy episode 2, and trust me, if you're not hooked by the first 10 minutes in, you have all rights to say that the game is just okay. However, with all of that said, I'm not here to toot the game's horn. Actually, I kinda am, because I completely understand how the character of number one was built from a game design perspective. You see, the Walking Dead game, season one at least, is about two things, survival and parenting. It doesn't sound that good on paper, but trust me, it works out pretty well. In the parenting aspect, it can be seen with most characters or relationships in the game, but the most obvious and effective is with Lee, the protagonist, and Clementine. While Lee might not be Clementine's actual father, I'll be damned if there is a single better parent character in video game history just considering all the shit he goes through to protect her. So logically, with a game about parenting like this, the most fitting thing to do for a final boss is someone who challenges that, and let me say, Stranger fits the bell pretty well. So, as early as the end of episode 3, you find that Clementine has been talking to a strange man on a radio. Fast forward to the end of episode 4, and she's nowhere to be found, but her radio is, with the same man talking. He says that he's got Clementine, and that if Lee cares about her enough, he needs to go and save her. Out of a very long chain of events that Ken have, but is not limited to walking through a herd of zombies, leaving Kenny and Ben to die, and chopping your own fucking arm off, you get to the place where the stranger is holding Clementine captive. And this is the point where he goes from hateable to number one on this list. He starts off his little speech by talking about his son Adam, who died. Now that's reasonable considering that it's the zombie apocalypse. It still sucks, but it's understandable. However, the way that he died was by the stranger taking him out hunting one day, against the mother's will, having him get lost, and the stranger leaving his own son behind, in the woods, in the zombie apocalypse. Understandably, when he came home, his wife was incredibly mad at him, to which the two of them and their daughter go out and look for him, in their brown station wagon. Yeah, if you played, you know that I'm talking about this brown station wagon, which you get the option to steal from. Whether you decide to take the stuff or not, it ends up being completely gone, to which the next day, the stranger's wife and daughter run away. The next day, he finds them dead on the side of the road. Now, I'm not gonna beat around the bush. All this sucks for the guy. However, besides that, there's pretty much nothing to like about him. First of all, he is a massive hypocrite. Despite taking his own son out for hunting and not bringing him back, he claims to Lee that he can be a better father to Clementine than him, citing all the terrible things that Lee has done throughout the game as proof. Even if you play a perfect game, kill as few people as possible, be as nice to Clementine as possible, and do absolutely nothing to this guy, he will still pull the same goddamn shit as if you played the game like a psychopath. Plus, on top of being a hypocrite, he's insane! You see that bag there? Yeah, he keeps his wife's decapitated, reanimated head in it. And then he talks to it! I don't care if the bottle or the lamp are more effective, or if it doesn't make a difference, or whatever, but whenever I play this sequence, I always leave the cleaver on the table so that Clementine will pick it up and chop his shoulder, causing him by far the most pain. With all this said, what are we left at? Well, we're left with a hypocrite, a madman, and the perfect thematic final boss for The Walking Dead Season 1, and my most hated character in video game history. You are a monster. No! You are! I'm Legendary Sponge, and Telltale's The Walking Dead, season one at least, is my favorite game of all time. See you guys next time.